the always outspoken Oliver Stone gets a bit prickly about some of my questions. You English always do that. They don't ask this on American television. <laughs> he does talk about the war on drugs. We have a huge problem. It's not going to go away. And his new movie. Names, history, stash that houses. That ain't part of the deal, buddy boy. It is now. There's a lot of twists. It's a wild ride. And the world of greed since he made Wall Street. The banks were doing what Gecko was doing in the 80s. Plus his unforgettable partying past. What was the greatest part? Um, I've been so many, I'm lucky, you know. And Mark Wahlberg's back with his latest project. Good evening, our big story tonight. A big man in Hollywood, Oliver Stone, won his first Oscar more than 30 years ago for his screenplay for Midnight Express. He's been turning our heads ever since, including groundbreaking and controversial films like Platoon, Born on the Fourth of July, JFK and Wall Street. His latest film is Savages. He's unapologetically opinionated about everything. Movies, politics, life, and I've got some tough questions for him. And I'm pretty sure he'll have some tough answers. Oliver Stone. Hello, Piers. Welcome. Right? I'm, I'm very excited about this because I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. I don't normally say that because it's a very, it's a very American thing to say that. We're British. We tend to hide our feelings. But <laughs> I have watched almost every one of your movies. And I love the provocative undercurrent to all of them. Yeah. And I love the fact that you in your own life are as provocative. You don't really take prisoners, do you? Uh, no, I try to be a politician. I try to be a diplomat. I try to do the... I don't want to offend people, and I certainly don't look for fights because you know what they end up in. It doesn't... pretty. So uh, I, what I am interested in is curious about the truth, and I, and I go for it, and I don't want to run away from what I know. So if someone says, you know, if you want to lead with a question and say, I can't run from the truth, at least maybe I can phrase it better. If you Google your name, almost everything that comes up on the first page involves the word controversial. Not really, but uh, yeah, that is a little bit exaggerated. A little I bit. think there is a body of work that stands up. You know, the, the controversial thing comes... But do you mind that, that is really the yes, point I'm I do, making. because it comes and goes, you know. It's like the weather, you know. It doesn't mean anything. It's the long-term implications. My work is, I think, good, and I think you go back and you look at that film that second and third time a few years later, you might have a... Say, well, you know, I don't know why everybody got so upset about that silly thing, because that was the headline, but the truth is there's a movie with a dramatic core, great characters, it's fun. I was fascinated by your early life with your parents. You sound extraordinarily charismatic people, very different, your father and mother, but you, know, you said about both of them, they're slightly mad, slightly crazy, <laughs> um, which you've clearly inherited, although you say you're calming down, but you know, you, they were divorced early on, you've been divorced twice, you've likened the movies to a divorce process. Yeah. Is, is there a theme that you see with your I never life? thought of that. I thought it was very clever of you to go there. I mean, I'd rather, much rather talk about the beautiful Blake Lively for We're more, going to come to the beautiful time. Blake Lively. But, uh, I'm know, trying to get to what makes my, you tick. Uh, my own life is... is uh, I, I, I haven't hidden it. I've tried... I've been to... Uh, you know, I've written about it and talked about it. And my parents were extremely colorful people. Dramatic, strong. Father was mother strong. And my mom is uh, still alive today. And probably watching. <laughs> so, uh, you know... But it was a wonderful story, and uh, that. But um, it really did hurt because at 14 years old, and you go off to a boarding school, as you, you're English, you know, and you disappear, and you don't, and you lose because you're the only child. That the family does separate, and then as a drama, and then it wasn't long before I was in Vietnam and the Merchant Marine and all these mm -hmm. things. So, no, I, I do miss the family life, and I'm trying to reconstitute one to some degree. What is your relationship like with your, your mother now? She's in her 90s, right? That's right. Has she been like most much? She's been your biggest. Fan and critic over the years? She thinks so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, put it this way, I have an interesting relationship, an ongoing one. It's contrary. There are many difficulties, and as there are, and you, I'm sure you mm. know what I'm talking about, families are difficult. Yeah. What do you think you got from your parents, from both of them? <laughs> Let, let's accentuate the positives. What are the, what are the stuff that you really think, thank you, I got that streak from you? The good stuff. Yeah. Oh, from, uh, from mom, I got a great sense of uh, love, uh, uh, emotion, affection, universal forgiveness. And, uh, and my dad, I would say I got uh, a sober uh, intelligence, a, a sense of looking at things and not falling into the fashion of the time, but just thinking for yourself as much as possible. Hard-working, independent, passionate, creative, and slightly crazy. This is, of course, what everyone who's ever worked with you says... Well, that's nice. Working for you is like. But that, and, I, and I think they mean all of them as positives. 
I think that my relation, I haven't been around, I mean, I've been around for these 19 movies and I've collaborated with a lot of people by now and I've worked for the most part, 98% of them well. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been a rich life. And people have brought enormous things to me because I've been open to them, not closed. Which of all the actors you've worked with has, <laughs> been, has been the best? Uh, Kevin Costner is as different from Anthony Hopkins as Night to Day, but they're both extraordinary to work with. Tom Cruise is as different from uh, Colin Farrell mm -hmm. as the Night to Day, but I enjoyed both uh, enormously. Charlie Sheen? Charlie Sheen was a young man when I worked with him on two films and on both films he was quite different you know but you saw you saw I, I, I felt he was that dreamy uh, quality in Platoon that I loved and when we got to Wall Street it became more cosmopolitan definitely and when you when you saw him have his sort of his mad period last year I know you're no longer that close to him, but what did you feel looking at this guy who you'd worked so closely with before I lost track of Charlie in the mid 80s, uh, late 80s, so, you know... I, I think don't... he lost track of Charlie in the mid-80s. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I did see him about a, uh, four months ago, three months ago, on a, on a reunion of Platoon, and he was, a, he was delightful to everybody. He, was, uh, he knew, he remembered everything, and we went and we laughed about some of the incidents in the forest. Who, who could out-party who? You or Charlie? Uh, at your peak? At that, at my peak? <laughs> we had fun in New York. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I mean, uh, Charlie, though, but no, Colin Farrell could out party all of us. Really? <laughs> well, this is what Char I've heard. I've heard this about in the Colin old Farrell. days. In the old days, you know. I mean, Char uh, Charlie too. All of you at your peak, who would be the greatest guest you'd have to a, par a party? Robert Downey was pretty wild. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so was Julia Lewis and Woody ha Woody Harrelson. I mean, Tom Sizemore. There was some <laughs> wild. Tommy Lee Jones. That's, that's like they're, they're fun. They're, and you know what? It's great to party with them. They're most most of them are fun. I mean, they were good drunks. Let's turn to Savages. Let's watch a clip from Savages first. Welcome to the recession, boys. You should be grateful you still have a product people want. Say you don't mind if your envelope gets a little thinner then. <laughs> you guys, you guys, you know, you, you, you have a clean business. There's no problems. But there ain't no Ben and Sean without Dennis. So my envelope stays uh. the same. It's a fascinating film. It's, it's, I watched it not knowing what to expect. I think there's some great acting in it. And there's a great theme of these two kind of you know, hippie character brothers. But they build this amazing marijuana plant. And it's all quite, it's the nice end of the drugs industry, isn't it? And then they collide right. with the nasty end, which is the, right. the really vile drug baron end. Right. And it all goes horribly wrong. You've been no stranger to drugs and you've spoken very vocally about it. What was your purpose of making the movie? What do you, what do you hope to achieve by it? Because all your movies have a purpose to them. It's a pretty hard-edged, you know, it's like writing a book. No, I think I made the movie because it was different, it was unpredictable. You used the word, you didn't know what was going to happen next. There's a lot of twists, it's a wild ride, mm. and you don't, you know, it's an improbable situation because we don't know anything about the present-day contemporary marijuana industry, and in California it's legal, mm. so these growers are growing it semi-legally. They're selling it out of state, but they're also selling it in state, which is legal. And of course, the cartel, at this, at, in a hypothetical fiction, wants to move in like a, a Walmart would move in on a niche business and take it over, or partner with them and learn their techniques. You've been to South America a lot, and you've been very outspoken about the way that, for instance, Calderon in Mexico has treated the, the drugs war. What is the simplistic answer, do you think? to the global drugs problem. It's not going to go away. This war right. on drugs got bigger since 1970 when Nixon declared it. It's gotten huge. And it, and it hasn't and, worked, has it? And the, US, and the Mexican economy would die without it because they need the money that goes into their legitimate economy. It's bigger than tourism. It's bigger than oil. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than remissions from their Mexican uh, immigrants back to their so country. So given that importance it's to huge economy, in this country. So I'm what do you saying. do, Oliver, about that? Given the importance to a country like Mexico's economy through this black economy, yeah. what, what do you do? If you killed the, uh, if you if you declared, uh, if there were no war on drugs, the Mexican economy would would have to would be radically would would dry up. I don't know. Even the banks would dry up. It wouldn't. It, it couldn't happen overnight. You'd have to move in a direction to to decriminalize it first of all, because in America we're suffering greatly. Mm -hmm. Not only do we have a huge DEA with a huge budget, Homeland Security is involved. We have, uh, you know, we've, we've militarized the war on drugs. We've made enemies. We've made them into narco states almost. So as a result, our prisons too, 50% of our prison system in America 
is victimless crimes. They, they, people who have never hurt anybody, they're in for marijuana and various charges that have nothing to do with punishment. It's a medical issue, and it, I think we have to move to decriminalization and legalization. Let's take a break, we'll come back and talk a bit more about savages, and also about politics, and maybe a dash of religion. Can you mention the film? Sort of I feel like you're on the roll. I started with the film. I said savages first, so then I got to politics. Love it. <laughs> CNN. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms. Greed for life, for money. For love, knowledge has marked the upward surge of mankind, and greed, you mark my words, will not only save Teldar paper, but that other malfunctioning corporation called the USA. Michael Douglas and Stone's 1987 film Wall Street, Douglas won a Best Actor Oscar for his role as the quintessential corporate raider, Gordon Gecko. Do you ever wish you hadn't done that particular scene? <laughs> the greed is good scene. No, I think it's, I love it. It's uh, powerful. It's, it's the movie works and it still does. Uh, it set up what's going on in our capitalism right now. Right, I mean, when, when you saw what unfurled, the greed is good. I mean, a lot of people Couldn't took it, it at face value, didn't they? Couldn't believe it, no. Yeah. Well, you know, the movies, uh, when we look at the Vietnam movies, too, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a change in society if they're successful. What happened is, of course, I couldn't believe it. When I went back to do Wall Street, Money Never Sleeps, 20, 30, 25 years later, was that the numbers that are hundred millions of dollars were a huge amount back then, then became a billion dollars and billions of dollars. And these corporations were wheeling and dealing without any, without the ownership issue has gotten. The banks were doing what Gecko was doing in the 80s, mm -hmm. the big banks. That's what happened. That's what's amazing. They became the buccaneers. Who's, who stops them? Because, I mean, nobody... The crash stopped them. Yes, the, but nobody went to jail. No one's been held yeah, to account. Nobody has stopped. Now it. they're chucking the same bonuses. There in are general. some laws that are being enacted, and I think they're important. Are they effective? Some are, yeah. The glass the law should be enacted, and, you know, Volcker rules should be enacted. It depends how they enact it, but definitely they would help. But the problem is we are in another place. Now, like in the war on drugs, it's the same thing. We've gotten it to such a huge amount that no one can quite figure out how to stop the hurricane. When you see your country $16 trillion in debt, and everyone squabbling over what most people say is an insubstantial solution. What do you think? Well, I think that's a pretty easy headline, you know. I have $16 trillion in debt means nothing to me. What means something to me is the unemployment figure, because a country such as the United States can't afford debt. What we need to do is get people working, and we need to spend money in a good, positive, productive infrastructure way, not on stupid war on drugs or wars in mm -hmm. Afghanistan and Iraq. We need to make a war for our country's infrastructure and also education and climate control. You fought in Vietnam. You've been to South America and seen the drug cartels in action. You've had a long lunch with one of the barons himself. Um, do you think it would help if more policymakers in America had experienced war? I do. I think it would be, uh, I think the World War II generation, the Korean War, these people were, were in Congress. It makes a big difference because they know war. And when you don't, you start to be like, uh, you know, a bit of a chicken hawk. And a lot of these neoconservatives that have started these wars in the last 20 years have no war record, except for Rumsfeld. He was the only one. I mean, Cheney, Rove, uh, Bush. It's not, a, it's not an attractive portrait of people who can call for other people to suspend their lives. And also, well, the whole issue of Vietnam, you know, the whole, uh, Lyndon Johnson never raised taxes, and Bush uh, Jr. never raised taxes during the, uh, the Iraq War. Mm. So, I, you know, the whole idea of how to fight a war is what's weird in this country. We have to learn that it's a national, if we go to war, it's a serious thing. It's Everyone's a in it sacrifice. together. Yeah, but we don't, we don't call it war in this country. We call it a mini event or something. We put it on TV and it's an advertisement or something. What was it you learned about yourself when you were in Vietnam? Oh, um, first of all, I learned to survive. Here's, that's the hardest thing of all, which is to say get smart. Because most of the time we go into a situation where we're a bit dumb. We don't know exactly what it's like until it happens. And when it happens, you learn fast. It's on-the-job training. So let's say I got 360 more visceral. Uh, more visual. I think I was a writer in my head, 
I think after the war was more of a, uh, a cinematographer, a, a director. You know, I could see things that I hadn't seen before, and I wanted to put things in visual terms as well. Well, Savage is about the drugs war, isn't it? <clears throat> I, I think your theme about war generally.